Greetings and salutations, squad. Welcome to this week's episode of Crime Squad Podcast. It's your girl, Natasha, the researcher, writer, and host of Crime Squad. If you're returning, thanks so much for your continued support. If you're new here, welcome to Crime Squad. I release a new episode bi-weekly featuring Canadian true crime cases, both solved and unsolved. I try to remember the victims without sensationalizing the guilty parties, and I like to challenge people's perceptions whenever I can. If this sounds like your kind of show and you haven't already, please be sure to rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps the show. Today's episode is going to be about a subject that is very controversial. I am a firm believer though that discussing controversial subjects is important because we all have different backgrounds and lifestyles. The hope is that by discussing topics like the one we're going to dive into today, we can learn to live together peacefully and respectfully. I know that sounds naive, trust me. And I know that I might invite some hatred my way for my thoughts and viewpoints. If I said I didn't care, I'd be lying. I don't like evoking frustration, hurt feelings, or hatred in people, but I also won't be a wallflower for issues I care about. This episode will contain descriptions of violence and suicide and may not be suitable for all listeners. I will provide resources at the end of this episode. Please seek help if you need to. The world won't be a better place without you. Okay squad, let's get into the cases of Alex Bastien, Kristen Shawanda, and Danny Cooper. If you're wondering what the topic of controversy is, you've made it this far. I hope you'll stay. First, I also want to say I am a safe space, and I will always be a safe space. This topic is sensitive, and I understand people don't like it. I understand people seem confused, afraid, or sometimes outright disgusted. But I have to call out the fact that hate crimes against transgender people have risen exponentially over the years. Another trigger warning for those of you who have hate in your hearts, this episode is going to contain definitions about non-binary and transgender individuals. If this is something that you cannot engage in, stop listening now. If you are open to seeing a different perspective, listen on. So as you all know, my name is Natasha and my pronouns are she, her. This means I identify as female, I outwardly present as a female, and I prefer to be referred to as she, her. I have many friends and even some family that identify with pronouns they, them. When I read comments from people on Facebook or on news sites, a lot of people have issue with they, them pronouns. I've heard people say it isn't proper grammar, that it doesn't sound right, that they don't understand how to refer to someone with those pronouns. Some things aren't going to be comfortable, but when we're uncomfortable, we're growing. We are shedding that skin and becoming something bigger. I used to be uncomfortable with it also, but when someone I love tells me that's how they identify, I'm going to do my best to refer to them in this way. Otherwise, what does that say about my support, my love, that it's conditional upon them identifying as the biological sex they were born with? Definitions for non-binary, transgender, and other helpful words will be in the description for this episode, so feel free to check it out if you want to learn more. Ultimately, and call me ignorant, I am having trouble seeing why a person choosing what gender they want to be is causing so much churn with people. I don't see how an assigned female at birth now identifying and presenting as male impacts my life whatsoever. But I do try to remember that this is a big deal to some people. Transphobia is defined by Merriam-Webster as an irrational fear of, aversion to, or discrimination against transgender people. This manifests in some really scary ways. Harassment and violence, for one. In Canada, a survey conducted by TransPulse Canada in 2019 revealed three in five trans women experience intimate partner violence. Statistics Canada published a report in 2018 that focused on experiences of violent victimization and unwanted sexual behaviors among gay, lesbian, bisexual, and other sexual minority people and the transgender population in Canada. Some interesting facts about this study. 
Transgender Canadians were more likely to have experienced violence since age 15 and also more likely to experience inappropriate behaviors in public, online, and at work than cisgender Canadians. Transgender Canadians were more likely than cisgender Canadians to have used drug or alcohol to cope with abuse or violence experience in their lifetimes. Transgender Canadians were more likely to report their mental health as poorer or fair than their cisgender counterparts and also more likely to have seriously contemplated suicide in their lifetimes. In the United States, there's been a lot happening regarding trans rights lately. In 2021, the Human Rights Campaign recorded 50 fatalities against transgender and gender nonconforming individuals in the U.S. In 2022, the numbers hit 38 fatalities. Let's be clear, fatalities means murder. The beginning of 2022 marked a record in United States legislation with Republicans in Arizona, Alabama, Indiana, Kentucky, Oklahoma, New Hampshire, and South Dakota filing at least nine measures against trans and non-binary youths in the first week of 2022 alone. This clearly was going to continue to be a continuing trend just to put things in perspective, in 2023 so far, and we're only five months into the year, the trans legislation tracker has tracked 533 bills filed, all of which seek to block trans people from receiving basic health care, education, legal recognition, and the right to publicly exist. So far, 49 states have filed these bills. 54 of them have been passed, 97 of them have failed, and 382 are still active. Now, Canada is nowhere near this, and hopefully we never will be. Do you want to know the impact on trans and gender nonconforming people because of how they identify? Do some independent research. Let's get into the story of Alex Bastien, our first featured individual in this podcast episode. Alex Bastien was born on June 20th, 2011 to parents Martin Bastien and Annick Dinell. Assigned female at birth, Alex's parents named their baby Anne-Sophie. As Alex got older, they told friends and family of their desire to go by the non-gendered name of Alex. Based on the articles I've read and my own experiences, as well as talking to another individual today about a child coming out with different pronouns or wanting to identify as a different gender, it's a very difficult thing to adjust to in some cases. Um, And in particular, it seems that it was difficult for Alex's family to accept. The family had a hard time actually referring to Alex as he or they um, because of Alex's age. Alex was quite young when they decided that they wanted to um, not identify necessarily as female. So I don't know what Alex's pronouns or desired gender were going to be because they were just beginning to figure it all out. I'll respectfully use the pronouns they, theirs, but we'll also refer to them by name, Alex. Now, I know nothing of Alex's childhood, as this is not something that's publicly posted. What I do know is that around the age of um, about seven and eight years old, Alex's parents noticed a shift in behavior. This manifested as aggressive behavior, especially at school, which had previously been very unlike Alex. According to Anik, Alex's mother, Alex had also begun trying to see how Anik and Father Martin would feel if Alex came out as gay, lesbian, or transgender. Anik and Martin assured Alex that no matter how Alex identified, they would love their child unconditionally. I really have to commend Alex's parents for doing the right things when Alex was questioning their gender identity and sexual orientation alongside the other attitude changes, such as disliking their own body. When Anik and Martin noticed Alex's shift in behavior and attitude, they enlisted the help of a doctor as well as a social worker to try and help. Part of the issue, as the doctor determined, was that Alex was going through something called precocious puberty. 
Now, I've never heard of this before, so I looked it up, and it's defined as early onset puberty, which generally occurs in females before the age of nine or in males before the age of 10. These changes can include growth spurts, first period, development of breasts, extra hair, enlargement of the testicles, all the fun things we go through when we hit puberty. It's difficult enough when you're a preteen going through it, but to go through it so young must be so scary and polarizing. The changes to Alex's body were obviously very upsetting to them because Alex started to express wanting to wear a binder to be able to bind their newly forming breasts, preventing womanly curves. Alex also wanted to explore the option of breast removal and had begun asking for boys boxer shorts in place of regular girl underwear. So Alex was then diagnosed as having gender dysphoria and did not want to identify as either male or female. Now, I know the idea of children choosing how they identify is heated at best. Many people believe gender shouldn't be part of the discussion in sex education at school. Many people, including people I have spoken to personally, believe the vast increase in using different pronouns and wanting to present outside of the perceived normal gender stereotypes is a fad. Kids are pressuring their kids to be something that they're not, and in order to fit into today's society, you have to be something other than what generations past have referred to as quote-unquote normal. If we could all just stop for a second, though, and consider some things. Firstly, perspective. Gender bending and not conforming to gender stereotypes isn't new. In the 1960s and 70s, the counterculture movement began manifesting itself through not only demonstrations, but also attire or dress. The clothing movement was developed to show self-sufficiency and the rejection of materialism. And a great example of this was the theater group The Coquettes. Formed in San Francisco, they were a group of gender-bending actors. Males often dress in drag and invited members to join the group, regardless of their gender or sexuality. And some of the more prominent rock stars in the 1970s would play with gender expression all the time. Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Iggy Pop, Alice Cooper. All of these individuals created flamboyant personas, wore makeup, dressed extravagantly. Even Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin regularly wore women's bosses. And in the 90s, there was a huge influx of androgyny showing up in fashion magazines and prolific individuals. So this concept of playing with gender or gender expression isn't a new thing. And it's ignorant to blame this on the kids of today or the woke movement or whatever other derogatory phrasing comes up around the concept of self-expression. Back to Alex. Unfortunately, Alex became the target of bullying at school. Alex also began to suffer from excessive worry and panic attacks at the onset of the pandemic. There was an active plan in place with the doctors and Nick and Martin enlisted to help Alex through this particularly distressing time. The last appointment was March 3rd of 2022 with a follow-up scheduled March 17th. On March 9th, Martin noticed Alex in their bedroom using the computer, which was not allowed. Squad, this is your warning that the next section contains events leading up to a suicide and may not be for all listeners. It is not gratuitous or descriptive. We don't talk about, um, you know, the method used or anything like that. But if you do want to skip this part, skip ahead about 45 seconds. So again, Alex was in their bedroom using the computer, which was not allowed. The household rule for electronics was that they only be used in common areas. After Martin, Alex's father, scolded Alex and left them in their bedroom to think about what they'd done, Martin checked in after about 15 minutes had elapsed. At this point, Alex was in the bathroom. When Martin didn't receive a response, he broke down the bathroom door. It was then he realized Alex was in the process of trying to take their own life. Martin, being a paramedic, was able to stabilize Alex and rush to hospital, but tragically, Alex would be declared brain dead on March 11, 2022. Alex was the tender age of 10. 
The funeral home posted a tribute for Alex on their website, and on it there was a written poem by Alex. I'm not certain, but it sounds like it could have been the final note Alex left for the family. It reads as follows. My name is Anne-Sophie Bastien, but I prefer to be Alex Bastien and I am 10 years old. I am aware that my hasty departure will leave you with an immeasurable void. Give me the first name you want. Talk to me as you wish have always done. Above all, don't use a different tone, nor a solemn or sad air. My heart was just too full and lost. What I was for you will always remain so. Keep laughing, singing with me as we did together. I am me, you are you. We are an entity in its own right. It was my choice. You do not have to feel guilty. You have given me everything to campaign on my behalf for the rights and freedom of expression so that we are respected as we are. If you feel the need, hold my hand. I'll ease your pain. You'll see everything will be fine because I'll always be here, just in the next room. Squad, I know that was tough subject matter. It's important, though, to say their names. Remember them. There is so much misunderstanding regarding the trans community and too much hate in the world. If you're wondering how you can support uh, and be an ally, I will post information on Crime Squad's Instagram at Crime Squad Pod. Creating safe spaces is so important because it seems like there are less and less of them out there these days. The next case we'll explore is unfortunately a short one because there's only one article online. I used my regular digital sources for newspaper archives as well, and no information came up at all in those sources. It's tragic because not only was this individual a transgender woman, but she was also Indigenous. The coverage for this case is tragic, and there's been no updates at all that I can locate. Okay, squad, let's talk about Kristen Shawanda. Born on April 14, 1993, Kristen Shawanda was many things. A person who loved life, a person who was an advocate for causes that were important to her. A person who supported her friends when they needed a voice. Kristen was First Nations from Sheguanda First Nation, which is located on Manitoulin Island in Ontario. The scenery she would have grown up with must have been incredible to see. Manitoulin Island is comprised of many different communities, and all of them offer a rich history and gorgeous landscapes. It's actually the world's largest freshwater island. The island is known to have its own community, and as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. Kristen lived with her father in her youth. Her parents split up in 1996 when Kristen was the age of three. Kristen's father was formerly chief of Sheguyanata. Kristen's mother, Cheryl, recalls some, but not all, of her daughter's childhood. She recalls there were some tough times, but also fondly remembers Kristen as being very outgoing and very vocal. She was quoted in the Manitoulin Expositor as saying, quote, She had a good sense of humor, and she liked other people. Whatever she could grasp at, she did. She went for. She knew she could do whatever she wanted to set her mind at. That was awesome about her. End quote. At the age of 20, Kristen moved from Manitoulin Island to Southern Ontario. She studied nursing and got a job in healthcare. She also eventually went back to school for business. It sounds like Kristen was an absolute force to be reckoned with. And knowing the adversity she faced simply because of who she was makes her that much more of a strong woman. Kristen was not only First Nations, but also a two-spirit and transgender woman. And Kristen was not apologetic for living as her authentic self. Looking at pictures of Kristen from her Facebook page, I am struck by her beauty. Kristen is truly a person who exudes warmth through her eyes and smile. Kristen has a smooth forehead and a gorgeous complexion. Her eyes are bright and alert and are framed by some seriously amazing brows. I have major brow envy of this girl. 
Her brown eyes sparkle and her makeup skills are on point because in every picture, her eyeshadow is flawless and well suited to her eye shape. She has a symmetrical and proportional nose leading down to full lips. Her jawline, jawline is pronounced but not sharp, leading her face to have a rounded shape. She sports an anchor tattoo just below her right front shoulder and has silky brown hair, which she seems to enjoy wearing long based on all the photos. I think though that my favorite thing about Kristen is her teeth. They are so charming because they aren't perfect, but I think their imperfections make them perfect. They just suit her so well. Kristen had a boyfriend named Liam and it's clear how in love they were. You can see it in their faces as they pose for pictures or snap selfies together. Kristen was so comfortable with herself, but it wasn't always like that. Her mother, Cheryl, recalls that Kristen's identity became obvious when Kristen was learning to talk, saying, quote, We could see it from the time she started learning how to talk. She was very feminine, and we could see that side of her. But she didn't actually discover herself until she was probably about 12 or 13 when she came out to us. I had always known. I was just waiting for her time to tell me." End quote. In recent years, Cheryl was working hard at reconnecting with her daughter. But that would all be cut tragically short because on August 23, 2020, Kristen was murdered. But that is all I know, and all her family knows also. That's it. The family has had a difficult time getting answers. They have no idea if Kristen suffered, how she was found, who killed her. The Manitoulin expositor reached out to the Hamilton police, who then referred the inquiry to the officer of the chief coroner and forensic pathology service. Neither the police nor the pathology service would provide any details on the ongoing investigation. But Cheryl said she is at least aware law enforcement is considering the death a homicide. Her daughter-in-law, Kathleen Carson Shawanda, has since tried to ensure a thorough investigation is conducted. Initially, police indicated there were drugs involved. However, a toxicology report would have taken about three months to validate this, and nothing further was ever released in the media. There are simply no updates. And while I was scrounging for information, I came across an article posted very recently indicating that Kathleen Carson Shawanda's husband was tragically found deceased in the river along with his first cousin. They were spending the day fishing and didn't return at the specified time. Both men leave behind wives and children, and they weren't even yet the age of 30. So much heartbreak in this family. If the murder of Kristen Shaw, if the murder investigation of Kristen Shawanda is ongoing, we wouldn't know it. Hamilton police, where Kristen lived and was killed, are remaining tight-lipped. I hope one day the family can get the closure they deserve. I do want to share something though that Kristen wrote on her Facebook page, dated November 3rd, 2019. It reads as follows. Now I've always felt I've been open and honest about who I was, no matter how hard it was. And from years of just shame, I had grown what some might call a really big wall. Now, maybe I am not always so socially open as all of you on Facebook or Twitter. But recently, I had began my transition into the beautiful young woman I always knew I was meant to be. Figuring myself out meant a lot of lying and a lot of hurt to me and you. I can't simply apologize to every single one of you now, but I am. This journey has been tough on me and has never stopped being trouble after trouble. I'm just looking to be as happy as the rest of you. So please forgive my shortcomings. I'm trying my best, damn it. Just be you. Be happy. And to anyone else who disagrees, well, you can just kiss my ass. Kristen is forever missed by friends and family and the island community who recalls her fondly. If you have any information about Kristen's murder, please contact Hamilton Police to let them know so they can continue to try and investigate this tragic case.
I'm sure most of us in Canada have heard about Bell Let's Talk. It takes place every year, usually the end of January. This one-day advertising campaign donates money to mental health funds based on the number of social media or communication interactions that include Bell's branded hashtag, Bell Let's Talk. One of the big focuses of Bell Let's Talk, which actually does continue to educate and donate to causes throughout the year, not just in January, is eliminating stigma around mental health. They also focus on care and access and research opportunities. According to their website, more than one in two people struggling with mental health challenges aren't getting the help they need. One in four Canadians have been experiencing high levels of anxiety and more than 200 Canadians will attempt suicide every single day, and 12 will be successful attempts, meaning 12 people die, daily. These numbers are disturbing. So many people are impacted by mental health challenges, myself included. In fact, I can say that of all my friends, more than half have experienced mental health issues or have a diagnosed mental health illness. I'm not shy to talk about my own experiences because I also believe in reducing stigma. At the age of 12, I was diagnosed with clinical depression and something called dysthemia. I have been on and off anti-anxiety and anti-depression medications starting from that age, and I'm currently utilizing not only medication, but also cognitive behavioral therapy. I also practice self-care, which for me looks like writing this podcast because I love researching and writing and giving victims a voice, but also volunteering within my community. I give back by giving my time to the Canadian Mental Health Association on a weekly basis. Last week from May 1st to 7th was Mental Health Awareness Week, and so I really wanted to be sure I included Danny's story in this episode. Danny wasn't targeted because of how they identified, but this episode is about remembering trans individuals who are no longer with us. And I really wanted to include Danny because of the social issues that surround their case. Okay, squad, let's talk about Danny Cooper. I do want to note here that the following account contains topics of mental health crisis and police violence. It may not be suitable for all listeners. I will not go into minute details or graphic descriptions, and that's really because six months after Danny was tragically taken from this earthly realm, there are still no answers. Danny Cooper, who was also known as DC, was born December 4th, 1994. Danny grew up in British Columbia, was active in the local Unitarian Church alongside her father, Dennis, who has been an active member for over 20 years. I had never heard of Unitarian Church, so I looked up the North Shore Unitarians, which is where Danny and her family were active members. I would like to share with you their mission statement because it's going to closely tie in to just the kind of person Danny was. First, the mission of the North Shore Unitarians is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. They will welcome all to their community, foster spiritual growth free of dogma, and inspire actions in the service of life. They teach religious tolerance, freedom of thought, and the use of reason. I'll highlight just a few more values here. They believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, and among many others, they believe in individual and communal action that accountably dismantles racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and our institutions. As you listen and you get to know Danny like I've had the pleasure of doing while writing this episode, you will see how this has manifested itself in them. I just want to address something here as well. I did something very out of my comfort zone squad. In the newspaper articles I read, it wasn't hard to see that Danny's father, Dennis, is very involved with trying to continue Danny's work of leaving the world a better place and trying to eradicate armed police officers as first responders for marginalized people. So 
I randomly sent him a message on Facebook Messenger explaining who I was and that I was hoping he'd give me some information about Danny if he felt comfortable to do so. Wouldn't you know it, at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so my time zone, I received a message back that Dennis would speak to me. Over a half hour, I got to know Danny through the eyes of their father, who, I might add, is an exceptional human being himself. Dennis actually pointed out that today, May 12th, is the six-month mark of Danny's murder. As we talked about Danny, the emotions flowed freely, both from Dennis and myself, although I tried to keep it together because it isn't about my emotions. It's about Danny and mourning the loss of such a beautiful soul. We also laughed together at certain memories Dennis shared and connected through the experiences of having a beloved family member come to terms with their gender expression and sexuality. I am so grateful and honored I was able to speak to Dennis and I will lovingly share the beauty of Danny so that we will always remember and hopefully some of you will step up and try to help Danny's family and friends get answers and push change forward. As you can probably already tell, Danny was many, many things. A kind and loving soul, a compassionate person who believed in seeing everyone, including the people who were so often overlooked by society. Danny saw them, the downtrodden, those who call the streets their homes, those who suffer from mental illness or substance use issues or both and are often cast aside as being less than. Danny didn't see it that way. Danny decided early on in life it was their mission to leave the world a better place, and after high school, they enrolled at the University of Victoria for social justice. It was their calling. They wanted to fix society. From a young age, it was understood that Danny was different. First, they were most definitely an empath. When I spoke to Dennis today, I asked him to tell me a memory he had of Danny, a fond memory that took him back to a happy time. His voice was so complex as he began to speak. It was full of love and warmth, but also utter heartbreak and devastation. He shared a particular memory of Danny, which was so vividly explained, I, it felt like I was there. When Danny was just a small toddler, maybe two and a half years old, the family decided to go to the local park to play. Danny, with their little toddler hands, found and picked up a dead ladybug off the ground and began to cry. There was such a deep sense of feeling, of utter emotion in those tears. Danny's mother, of course, asked, what's wrong? And Danny said, I'm crying because the ladybug won't get to go home to its family. <laughs> what a beautiful memory that could not have represented Danny and their nature more. And I'm so humbled to have heard it told firsthand. Danny was clearly very comfortable expressing themselves uh, in the way that they wanted to be perceived. At the age of 10, Danny left to their own devices one day, as 10-year-olds tend to be trusted to play on their own, found a pair of scissors, which they then used to cut off all their hair into a very short style. And it was then that they started choosing a more masculine style of dress. What Dennis found fascinating, again, was how comfortable Danny was expressing themselves in that way. They were comfortable doing what they wanted to do and wearing what they wanted to wear. In fact, Dennis recalls an instance where a waiter at a restaurant had said to Danny, what did you want to order, buddy? Dennis asked Danny if it bothered them that they were identified as a boy using this male colloquialism, and Danny just shrugged it off. Classic Danny, operating with such a level of grace and was very forgiving of people if they misgendered them in the early stages of them finding out who they were. At the age of 12, Danny participated in a gender and sexuality panel discussion with the Unitarian Church they belonged to. I have a small clip of that segment, and the microphone is passed to a young Danny who says such wise words. Danny says, quote, The number one thing I would say is just to, if you can do anything, try to view gender as a spectrum instead of just girls or boys is like the most helpful thing you could possibly do for kids like me that grew up and were constantly trying to fit into the girl or boy box. If you could just like see people like me and be like, you're just who you are and do what you want with your body and your life, 
then that's just like the awesomest thing ever, end quote. At the age of 15, Danny came out to their family as gay, and their family was extremely supportive. Dennis had a chuckle here where he said he and his now ex-wife had known all along, like parents often do, especially if they're intuitive and pay attention. But it was Danny's path to travel, and so finally they were comfortable to come out as who they were. One thing is for sure, they were a force to be reckoned with when it came to causes they supported. An intelligent and thoughtful person who could be playful, but also a wise and passionate person who consistently made it known they cared. They cared about people. They cared about their community. In later photos of Danny, taken later in their adulthood, I see a very handsome person with a charming smile. I chose a particular photo to describe, which you can see on my Instagram at Crime Squad Pod. The backdrop is so stunning and compliments Danny wonderfully. Behind Danny is a blooming tree of gorgeous pink flowers, and it just speaks to me of growth and hope. Danny wears their hair very close cropped, and it's a sandy blonde color. Their eyes just pop right out of the picture. It's amazing how much is conveyed through Danny's face. Their bright blue eyes twinkle and crinkle just so. Their nose is perfectly proportioned, their smile big and wide. Looking at Danny's face, I can't help but smile right back at them. It seems like this is the effect they had on most people, based on how fondly they are remembered. If you haven't already guessed, Danny identified as non-binary and transgender. Although pictures of Danny may not reveal this because of the light that pours out of them, life wasn't all sunshine and roses. It takes a lot to live as your authentic self in society, especially when there is so much violence against so many groups. Racism, transphobia, homophobia. Despite the great strides, it seems like the world has taken to support people in the BIPOC or two-spirit LGBTQA plus communities. There is still so much work to be done. And Danny was so unapologetically who they were. They used pronouns they, them. But this authentic living isn't without its own set of traumatic experiences. At some point, Danny began abusing opioid medications. The drug use was just a symptom of a greater issue, which essentially was the traumas Danny experienced while being out in high school. One particularly disturbing incident was revealed by Father Dennis in an article by the Taiyi. Dennis admitted that students had violently bullied Danny because they were transgender. Dennis was quoted as saying, quote, they were literally stripped and dragged into the forest in high school. Just crazy, crazy stuff, end quote. To compound the substance use, Danny also had lived experience with mental health challenges. At some point in Danny's life, they were diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. This is a mental health illness that displays as a combination of symptoms of schizophrenia, such as hallucinations or delusions, and symptoms of of mood disorder, such as depression or mania. As mentioned earlier, Danny wanted to better their world, and felt their calling to do this was by helping their community, specifically by being a voice for marginalized groups. Danny put their heart and soul into social issues, including homelessness, the overdose crisis, and issues in mental health. One of the major things Danny was fighting for was ending discrimination, criminalization, and imprisonment of those in Victoria, BC, who were suffering from housing challenges, substance use issues, and mental health crises. In a very well-written article for thevolcano.org written in 2018 by Danny, they call out figures and facts related to police budgeting and call for police to be removed as first responders to these marginalized individuals, with more focus and funding directed towards social and health services. Danny argued social and health services focus more on de-escalating instead of being reactionary and potentially reacting with force or violence. At just the age of 27, Danny had already developed a reputation for being a beloved queer organizer and activist who worked hard to be that voice, to change the world, to leave their mark, to expose injustice. According to Danny's father, Dennis, one of Danny's biggest desires for change was related to, quote, 
The belief that armed police officers weren't suited to help people in crisis, whether they be homeless, in mental distress, or part of another traditionally marginalized community. And And this is why Danny's tragic end is so horrific. On November 12th, 2022, Danny was suffering from a psychotic episode. This presented as delusional thoughts, specifically that Danny's mother, whom they were with at the time, was overtaken by aliens. Danny grabbed a small knife with a serrated blade. Danny, suffering from delusions, was scared and confused. They wanted to try to help their mother. But in a psychotic episode, when thoughts can't be expressed properly and paranoia and delusions are present, it can be a scary time. Danny's mother ran to a nearby neighbor and called police for a wellness check on Danny. Five armed police officers arrived on scene, and around 7.30 p.m., a mere 10 minutes after police arrived, shots rang out into the evening. 30 minutes later, after Danny was taken to the hospital, Danny died. Less than a month before their 28th birthday, Danny's life was stolen. And ironically, Danny left this earth the very same way many others were taken before them. Danny, who tried to bring awareness to this very same situation and was trying to prevent this situation from happening in their community. Danny lost their life because armed police officers arrived on scene as first responders to someone having a mental health crisis. Sadly, six months later, actually six months to the day, Danny's friends and family are still waiting for answers. Because the police shot and killed Danny, an independent investigation is launched by British Columbia's Independent Investigations Office, or IIO. This is a civilian-led police oversight agency responsible for conducting investigations into incidents of death or serious harm that may have been the result of the actions or inactions of a police officer, whether on or off duty. But it's been radio silence since the investigation began. And Dennis wants answers. He wants to know why Danny was shot within only 10 minutes of being surrounded by five officers of the law. He wants to know how many times Danny was shot. He wants to know why the area wasn't cordoned off or made secure until de-escalation or negotiation could be completed. Was there an opportunity to contact mental health advocate or social worker to assist in this situation? And finally, how threatened did the police officer who fired the initial shot feel to have fired a lethal shot? And let's be clear, it was obviously a lethal shot meant to kill because Danny died. This wasn't a shot to the arm to subdue a suspect who's brandishing a knife. And again, we don't even know if Danny was brandishing the knife. And let's be clear again, Danny is small in stature, despite being full of spirit. Danny was 90 to 100 pounds on average and stood only five feet tall. Was there any attempt at all? at non-lethal force? We'll have to wait a little longer to see what comes of this. In the meantime, Danny is gone, but not forgotten. Kay Gallivan, an artist and friend of Danny's, created a stunning mural to commemorate Danny's life and spirit. The mural is located beside the Wildfire Bakery, a location Danny frequented while at the University of Victoria obtaining their social justice degree. A portion of Danny's ashes were mixed into purple paint and used to paint hearts on and around the smiling picture of Danny on the mural. Dennis has fought tirelessly to carry the torch and leave the world a better place in honor of Danny. He has had poetry and writings created into a book which he plans to distribute as part of letter writing campaigns and a further means to bring awareness to Danny. He asked if he could mail me one, and of course, I eagerly accepted this beautiful opportunity to keep Danny alive in spirit. If you want to help, there is a letter writing campaign that takes place on the 12th of each month. 
head on over to northshoreunitarians.ca slash Jedi dash team, and you'll see the call to action to help get justice for Danny Cooper. Here you can find templates for letters, or you can write your own, to send to the email addresses provided. The Jedi team has an excellent mandate, and the acronym is pretty amazing too. JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. If someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis or needs support, you can connect with mental health professional one-on-one -on -one by calling 1-888-6810 or text WELLNESS to 686868 if you're a youth. For adults, call 1-866-585-0445 or text wellness to 741741. So that is going to do it for this bi-weekly episode squad. I urge you to challenge your perceptions or if you consider yourself an ally, really make sure you're showing up for people. Don't be afraid to reach out if someone needs help you can direct them to resources. Consider saving resources in your phone so you can share if you need to. I'm actually gonna end this episode with a song that Dennis Cooper provided me. The sound quality isn't amazing, but it is a very touching and haunting song with lyrics that sent goosebumps up my spine and brought tears to my eyes. Thank you so much for listening. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already become part of the squad. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode of Crime Squad Podcast. As always, feel free to email me at crimesquadpodcast at gmail.com or via direct message on Instagram at crimesquadpod if you have feedback or ideas on cases you want to see covered. And as always, remember to stay safe and be kind to each other.
the coffin. I 